was a medium level manager rolling out the network. And then they gave me this big job. So when I went back to see my engineering pals, they laughed. And they laughed very, very hard. And so that thing about the hero having to cross the chasm a couple of times is really, really important. Um, and I always had, with a title like that, about one third of the board, because that's the people I reported to, about one third of the board hated me and, um, and, and didn't want anything to do with me, and the others loved it. And so there was this constant battle always, you were always having a struggle, and I had to find ways to get them involved. So for instance, one of the things I'd do is um, I had a, a roadmap to the future made out of post-it notes and newspaper articles and things like this we'd found, stuck on a wall. And even the people that hated me um, in the board would come by and despite not wanting to talk to me, they couldn't resist looking at the roadmap to the future, pointing out usually things that they thought were wrong, or oh, that's wrong. But they were then involved in the story. And they would start to comment on it. And I could say, oh, well, what do you think is right? And then we put their thoughts up as well. Anyway, it's, a, it's an aside, <coughs> because I want to talk about something else entirely. And um, I can click it from... Okay, thank you very much. So I've got this thing to click, and I'll see if it works. And so this is, a, this is not a story of my life, this is a story of something that happened to me, and it's kind of a story within a story within a story. So you'll have to follow it and try and hear it, because I, well you'll see, you'll see the stories come out. It goes, uh, it goes from something very, very tiny, like walking, and, and builds into something which I think could be a suggestion for a, a worldwide dialogue that I would like to have. Are you ready? So that's my story. I'm also going to race through it, so I'm watching the clock, I'm going to try and do this in 20 minutes or so. Let's see what happens. So it's about commitment. Uh, so why is it about commitment? Well, first off, what is commitment? It's an agreement or a pledge to do something in the future. It's something pledged, or it's a state or instance of being obligated or emotionally impelled, as in a commitment to a cause. So that's the kind of thing I wanted to talk about. And, um, and commitment to what? Well, for me, um, there's a commitment that's uh, really important to me because I have some things that I worry about. These are some of them. I'm sure you worry about some of these. Um, I'm worried about um, access to secure, reliable, renewable energy. I'm worried about the availability and distribution of life-giving resources. Don't forget, I'm supposed to be a futurist, so I work with these things on a regular basis. I'm worried about what's happening with regards to climate change. I'm worrying about endemic regions of poverty and what we're doing about them as a planet. I'm worried about the pop population of the world and where it's headed. Uh, and how capable we are of dealing with the population in those places. I'm worried about the tests to our global financial system. I'm worried about needs now and needs for the future. These things really, really concern me. They're part of my day job. And then a funny little thing happened. So this is, this is me just working. These are things I'm regularly talking about. Clients are asking me questions which might be dumb. They might ask for a better ketchup bottle or a different shaped bar of soap. But they'll bring those issues to the table, right? They might ask me a better question as well, but sometimes they ask me dumb questions. And those are the kind of things I worry about. And then I got this phone call. One day I was actually working in my loft at home. I remember the day I got the phone call. And they said, um, they said would you like to be part of a, a, a post-crisis leadership in Europe think tank? And I said, what crisis and is it over? And they said, you're in. So away we went, and they had assembled a mini year. Did anyone Dutch in the room? A couple of Dutchies. Do you know De Back? Do you know Harry Starren? No. So, so De Back is a, is a humanist-based organization uh, founded around the 1950s, and they work particularly in entrepreneurship and, um, and in innovation. These are the things that really, really excite them. They're lovely, really wonderful people to work with. They're in Nordvig. Yeah. Um, and in Antwerp as well, believe it or not. Uh, but uh, but Nordvig is a lovely place to go anyway. So if you ever get a chance to go see the back, there's these wonderful people. When you go to their offices, um, it's difficult to find um, anything other than what looks like a hotel reception. Because they just want you to be there and to think and to be broad in your thinking as well. So they invited me to participate in this think tank, this mini, mini Europe, because there were lots of us from all around the globe, uh, particularly in Europe. And we were thinking about what happens after crisis. They were thinking about the financial crisis, of course. But what do we do? We, what, where does leadership go next? And we had several um, think tanks, as you might do, so conversations. And in one of those conversations, I told a personal story. And the personal story was about um, walking with Hugo. Hugo is, uh, is my dog. <laughs> Hugo? <laughs> well, I have a different image of Hugo, and uh, this is him. <laughs> he, 
He has a better nose. <laughs> Wouldn't you think? A better nose for him anyway. So what happens is I told them the story of how I'm constantly dealing with these big issues, you know, endemic poverty and distribution of resources and energy security and climate change, all these things that I'm regularly working with. But my problem as a consultant is I go in and help these organizations do this, but I don't ever get to see the results, or at least not too often. Because I go away again. They don't want me there for that. They're going to deal with the results. So what I do is when I walk with Hugo, I do something else. I pick up rubbish. And the reason I pick up rubbish is I'm changing the world when I do it. Does that make sense to you? At a very low level, every day I can change the world. And I pick up rubbish. I don't pick up that much. I just pick up a little bit. I pick it up in, in a place where uh, two kinds of people can see me. One is, um, I want people who threw it down to see me. Because they might think, hang on a minute, maybe I shouldn't throw rubbish out. That's the first thing. And the second group is, maybe somebody will see me and think, well, hang on. If he can pick it up, so can I. So I told them the story. We had a nice little chat about it. And they said, that's a great story, Patrick. Please can you, um, please can you write it down? Uh, sorry, that's my, that's my example. I'm going to fill in this table for you. My action is I'm picking up rubbish. The level of commitment is just me, just one person. And I hope some of you might pick up rubbish, but you may not. You may not, yes? That's the idea. So they said, Patrick, what a fantastic story. A really good story. I said it with a bit more time than what I just told you. But it was one of those good stories. had a nice moment in the room. And they said, please, can you write it down? So another story. And I said, well... Well, sure, I, I can write it down. I'm not as good at writing as, say, Clive might be, or maybe as you might be, so um, I had some difficulties with it. Most importantly, I couldn't write a story that was just about me and my dog. It's a nice story, it's a fun story, and it helps me, and maybe it's useful. But it's not a big enough story. So I think it needed um, a bigger conversation around it. So it struck me, as I got to thinking about it, that is so much of what we talk about. In rooms like this, or in business environments, or in meetings, or workshops, we spend a lot of time talking about systems, and not so much time talking about commitment. And what strikes me about the dog story is that's just a commitment. No one told me to do it. No one's measuring my results. You don't know if I'm going to pick up any more rubbish tomorrow or not. I might have just lied to you. It doesn't matter. It matters only to me. It's my commitment. Does that make sense? There are systems around rubbish, we'll talk about that in a minute. But it just struck me that if I was going to write this down in a paper, which eventually went into a book, um, I needed to have something more than me and my dog, Hugo. So I talked about systems and commitment, and then I thought about some different areas where this might be appropriate. If you wanted to, say, as a country, tackle something like the obesity epidemic that's coming our way, you might think about the systems required. There's definite results required or work required on food labeling. We need to get better at what diet advice we give. For instance, in this country, we tell children five a day. That's what they, you know, you get told that as well. But kids get told five a day, and they're talking about fruit and veg. Or maybe better town planning, so that it's not so easy to use your car. But what's the personal commitment required? And it is eat right for your metabolism. Uh, there's a wonderful guru here, so it's like deviation. There's a wonderful guru here I'm going to tell you about, so write this name down, please. A guy called um, Michael Pollland, P-O-L-L-A-N-D. He writes some marvelous books about eating. Uh, one of them is um, The Omnivore's Dilemma, one of the best books I've ever read in my life. Fantastic book. He also writes a, he wrote a smaller book, easier to read, you can read it one night, called Food Rules. R-U-L-E-S, Food Rules. And what's interesting to him is he's researched other topics before as a journalist, but the more he researches food, the more he thinks it boils down to a single phrase, which is, um, it's a bit like a guiding principle, funny enough. He says, um, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I'll just explain that just for a second. I'll get back on topic. Eat food is, eat stuff that looks like the thing it once was. So a pork chop is better than ham, because the pork chop looks like the pig. The ham has been cured and hung and so forth, right? Haribo. Don't eat Haribo. Because it doesn't look like any food. So eat food, that's the first thing. Um, not too much means don't eat till you're full. 